from some really interesting retail concepts around the world. So we thought what we'd do for this edition is to bring some of those stores to you. And I've invited in the studio Matt Hayward, who is the Insights Director of Fitch, to share with you his 10 best retail concepts that uh, he thinks you really should have a look at. And uh, in uh, today's environment, it's nice to get some inspiration away from sort of the doom and gloom and get some inspiration because at the end of the day, having retail concepts that uh, consumers and customers feel excited about is one of the key drivers of uh, driving retail sales. So, Matt, very warm welcome, and uh, let's start off in probably no particular order, but let's start off with uh, the first of your top 10. So in at number 10 is Uniqlo New York. This is their flagship store, and what's so uh, fascinating and impressive about this store is it's a value retailer, yet the environment itself is very high-end. A lot of cues were taken from the likes of Prada in Tokyo, and what's What's great is the scale, the size of the store, and the fact that you use colour blocking so to such great effect. Here you've got huge polo shirt racks all the way to the top of the ceiling, and it creates a really impressive scale, and you forget that it's a value retail. I mean, Unigo are quite an interesting company, sort of established really in 1984, um, and their sort of first store um, was uh, in uh, Hiroshima. Um, and they're really developed uh, around the world in one of Japan's leading clothing stores. Do you think that they've got the opportunity of uh, really making it big around the world? The time hasn't been better. We're seeing American Apparel doing very well in today's current climate. Uniqlo are optimistic, they're upbeat. Uh, I think their clothing is spot on for the trends at the moment, particularly in, in Europe and America. So I think they'll do very well going forward if they're able to match the store environment with the quality and trend-setting nature of their clothing. I suppose their market positioning, if you take sort of an American context, is you know, wanting to have the style and sophistication of probably J. Crew, but yet the pricing of the gap or something slightly lower than that. Do you think that the way in which the store comes across that positioning works? From the stores we've seen around the world, it does. And what they're great at, as opposed to J. Crews and the gaps, is making sure that each store fits the environment and the community that it's within. So it's very different in Tokyo to New York, to Chicago, and that's great because, you know, so are consumers. Great, that's good, that's number 10. What's uh, at number 9? Okay, in at number 9 we have Sephora, the uh, French uh, beauty and, and drug retailer. Why uh, I think Fitch loves Sephora um, so much is that it's such an optimistic environment. There's always something going on, it's a great buzz a around retailing. There's plenty of staff, there's plenty of makeovers, it really exudes the latest and newest in beauty trends. So from a store environment, it's also very good at editing ranges, giving you top fives, top tens, uh, and a very opinionated point of view of beauty products. Of course, Sephora really were the first in this area to, to break the mould. Um, I suppose beauty products were very much uh, the provenance of some of the department stores that were behind glass. Um, and along came Sephora really looked at the market in, in a different way. Um, again, do you think that this is something that can work universally across the world? With Sephora, what, what's interesting about Sephora versus department stores is that every time we visit um, the, the Champs Elysees store, the mood and the environment becomes sort of a more nightclub, it's more youth focused. And I think that youth focus is translating around as they try and capture a different market section, a bit more like Superdrug in terms of that age section. Of course, Sephora are owned by um, LVMH, uh, Mary Hennessy and Louis Vuitton. Clearly they've got a lot of scale and a lot of resource in order to, to put behind their, their marketing. But I think it is interesting that uh, most of their marketing is uh, by word of mouth, um, as opposed to uh, the way in which some of the big sort of beauty companies have gone. It is uh, in store as well, that they don't always they don't celebrate things that, that much. It's a case of you have to keep going in week after week to see what's new and Sephora will always try something new. They were the first to have male beauty ranges from Jean-Paul Gaultier. Here we've seen some examples of their new um, 
natural or organic ranges, they'll try it. If it doesn't sell, it doesn't work, they'll move on. They're, they're a fluid and dynamic company, and that's what gives them the, the, the driving retail energy. I think one of the interesting things to me about Sephora is they've also managed to be very innovative about the products that they stock. And a lot of very small um, local sort of manufacturers and, and brands that are just starting off have actually managed to get some good distribution in Sephora. Um, where, of course, some of the uh, department stores wouldn't take a small, up-and-coming brand. They've, they've very much taken the Selfridges line. It's about being um, the art of the creator, and I think that's really important. And it's something they do is get a great mix of well-known brands and new things. So that, again, drives football. It's almost a, a sort of retail ritual to go to Sephora each week to see what's new, to see what new brands you can spot and make big. Great. Okay, so that's uh, number nine. What about number eight? Number eight, we um, going, going going east to uh, Tokyo now, uh, sorry, Japan, to, to look at a brand called BIC. BIC is a huge electronics um, retailer, and this is their Osaka flagship store. What's very different about BIC is quite clear from the outset. Their stores are huge red fascia, and they have um, intelligent QR codes on the front of their stores. So, for instance, when the store's shut, I can take my mobile phone, take a picture of the QR code, and I'm automatically directed to BIC's online retail uh, system. So I can shop 24 hours a day. If the store looks too busy, I can also go away and shop on my mobile phone. So they've really got this concept of sort of multi-channel retail. Multi-channel, and they are leaders in technology, retailing and product selling, so it's only, only right that they should also practice what they preach. And what's the in-store environment like? I must say, it's nothing quite prepares you for a big store. Um, they are crazy. Uh, every, single, every single brand tries to shout louder than the other. And by shouting, I mean men and women that actually shout and try and get your attention. So it's very much a market environment. The use of colour is to the extreme, a lot of bright, bold colours. Uh, and it really is an absolute tour de force and, and quite, quite an overwhelming experience. But once you've, once you've had that level of overwhelming retail, everything else just seems a little bit too calm and sedate. And, and, and does that sort of madness, does that help with the overall value proposition? I think it does. It, again, it goes back to that market feeling. It feels like this is the place to one, the only place because there's so much range and choice and there's such a specialist. And through that being a specialist, um, you think you can't get a better price. And what a great way to compete online. I mean, it, there's no substitute for the first-hand experience as opposed to the online experience. So it, it's, a, it's a driver for retail. Okay, so uh, from Tokyo, where do we go from next? We, we, we definitely come down from the madness and we, we look at uh, uh, Dalesford Organics flagship store in the Cotswolds. Um, what Dalesford have done um, very successfully, I mean, this is the store entrance you'll see, it's, uh, quite, it's not on the high street, it's actually located on the farm. So this is about a reconnection with the ingredients and, you know, I can't think of a better provenance story. The farm's there, the products are sold in store. Um, from, from farm to fork um, in a few meters. But what this particular Dalesford um, lifestyle concept has done is combined food, a food hospitality proposition, a proposition in uh, beauty, and also in clothing. So it's a great place to go for you know a day out. This is leisure retailing at its best. Of course, Dalesford have been the sort of the pioneers in this uh, in the organic movement and uh, a resurgence of sort of uh, the artisan crafts. Um, is this something that is uh, reflected across the, both their product range and the way in which they display? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, in terms of um, unpacked vegetables, um, I think also the staff. The staff are, are very articulate, they're very knowledgeable, uh, and a lot of natural colours and natural materials used in the in-store environment. Uh, a lot of great stone that goes into, um, in, into the farm, actual products and area as well to create the environment. So yes. A lot of people say, well, actually, the Dalesfords of this world, they're, they're very one-offs. Um, what lessons are there for more sort of mainstream and uh, uh, volume retailing from the way in which Dalesford have worked and positioned and, and displayed their products? When you go to these stores, I think you only have to look at uh, the set of people that go. It's very much a community, and it feels very different. And people don't necessarily, they want to spend time here. So they've created a, a, what I would say is a decelerated retail experience and one that evokes um, a, a day out experience. So I think in terms of learning, um, we're seeing a lot of convenience with food, which is a definite trend and has to be accelerated. But on the other, as a complete tangent, we also want to see a de-accelerated, decelerated 
retail food and uh, lifestyle experience. So I think the learnings are making sure you've got a format proposition that works across all those touchstones and in different areas. Of course, Dalesford now have got a number of different uh, outlets, not only their, uh, their, their, since their home, their farm outlets. Um, they've got some concessions in department stores like uh, Selfridges. Um, I saw some of their products uh, in, in the store of Hong Kong recently as well. So, so clearly, um, that proposition is, uh, is gaining momentum and, and gaining ground. I suppose my only um, issue would be in an environment which is much more cost conscious, uh, whether the significant price premiums that uh, consumers have to pay for um, those type of uh, products are going to be, uh, um, uh, consumers are going to find that that's going to be uh, something they're prepared to pay from time to time. I think the export model does work. It's quintessentially an English brand and that translates very well from fashion um, to, to food and it always is of resounding quality. So I think it's quality first. Um, in terms of value, I know consumers are looking at uh, a question of you know, do, do I want it versus do I need it as a tension. Uh, and I think as long as you have an experience, you're not only paying for a premium product, but you're also getting a value added experience. And I think that's the difference as opposed to just a product that's expensive, there's the experience that's attached to it. So from the artisan, where's you next? Now we go, um, we go back to uh, the States and we go to Dallas. We go to a quite fascinating um, supermarket, uh, the first Hispanic themed supermarket. I remember taking clients there and uh, we were all driving uh, in a crazy minibus and literally they said, I don't want to be part of this, it, it, it's, a, it's a downtown area. We all felt rather uncomfortable. They said, there's no way there's going to be any directional retail in this area. Turn back, you've got it wrong, Matt. I had to hold, my, hold myself together, composed and said, no, bear with me. We got to this store and from the outset it was completely different to anything we'd ever experienced before. So, so give us a feel for A, the, the, the the product sector and then be the experience as you walk through the door. Product straight away, you know you're somewhere different when they're selling cactuses um, for consumption, the focus is on chilies. This is really about a carnival atmosphere and a celebration of Hispanic food. It's done um, in a completely dark environment, black gloss um, ceiling and floors, lights. Um, it doesn't feel tacky, which is a great thing because they really showcase the food. The lighting is, it is spot on in the sense that it it's very directional and celebrates the food, so that's all you see. You have a journey of food and hospitality. And Dallas is quite an interesting area actually because a lot of uh, new development concepts start off uh, in Dallas. Um, so um, it's always a, a good place to go to, to to see the latest and the greatest. It is, and I think you know, for quite a while Dallas has traded on that and, uh, and unfortunately those concepts haven't always gone anywhere. Uh, they've, they've stayed there for a good five or ten years. Um, what I hope we'll see with this is, um, if not in a whole format, elements of the ethnic focused retail will, will, will develop. And I know Walmart are now also looking at Hispanic themed um, stores as well. So this is a, a real hot learning bet. Yes, in fact, I think it was only uh, uh, this week that they announced that they are going to try a, a new Hispanic format. So if, um, um, if you wanted to give a bit of advice to Walmart, which elements of this um, concert would you say they need to put into their uh, new Hispanic format? focus on, on food and food production. That's what's key here. It's about fresh food, um, different ingredients. I think, I think also staff are really key. I've never been welcomed by store managers before on a store retail audit uh, and were so open with figures, um, guided tour that you know, literally you, know, you, you would never get anywhere else. So I think that also goes to the fact that because it's Hispanic, it's got to be relaxed and it's, um, it's a fun environment. I mean, I've never seen so many happy supermarket shoppers. Excellent, well that's, uh, if, uh, you know, that's a really good uh, environment for, for consumers, frankly. Happy, uh, happy consumers mean they probably spend more. So.